Um, how many people are business owners that would feel that SEO could really help them out? <laughs> That's what I figured. That's cool. That's great. So I'm, I'm going to try to give you a, a brief overview, <coughs> high level. Uh, there's some logical spots that we'll pause and I'll answer some questions. I don't want you guys to sit through this whole uh, presentation and just not be able to interact. So uh, feel free to stop me at any time and ask any questions. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll start off. So how to capitalize on SEO. I'm assuming Spacebar should do it. Yeah. A uh, little background on myself. My name is Mike McMillan. Uh, I've worked in the digital world since 1999. Uh, I've been focused on SEO since 2009. Uh, I built the largest SEO agency team in Nova Scotia and currently working as an independent SEO consultant. That's pretty far away. And where are we at? What is SEO? Does anybody have any ideas? Somebody want to take a stab at it? Sorry? Search, search engine optimization. That's it? Yeah. Anybody got a more involved answer? Like, what is search engine optimization? How you found it when somebody Googled you. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Moz has a great explanation here. Where search engine optimization is the practice of increasing, <coughs> excuse me, the quantity and quality of traffic to your website through organic search results. So it's not just about getting a, a lot of traffic, it's about getting qualified traffic that's going to convert the people that you want. You're basically, we use Google to answer questions, and the more you can answer questions for people, the better you're going to do. The analogy I like to use is SEO is a garden. Um, I'm a gardener. This is not my garden. It does not look that good, uh, especially right now. But um, with, an S with an SEO strategy, you've got, um, I like to use the garden analogy because there's you have the technical aspects that you have to build up. So like you want your soil to be in a good position. You want to have your pH balance as well. Uh, you want to make sure you're getting lots of water, getting lots of uh, sunlight. Um, and then the plants are like your individual pages or your content. And if you give it the proper food, the proper soil, the proper water and, uh, and sunlight, it's going to do well. But there's going to be stuff outside of your control. Hurricane can come through. We could get an early frost. Random snow dump in, I don't know, July. I don't think that's going to happen. But that, that's the analogy I like to use for SEO. I think it helps to explain it. And there's four main uh, elements I like to think of from an SEO standpoint. And they're, uh, it turns out to be trap. I should really put them in the order to be T-R-A-P. But authority. So that's basically who's <coughs> linking to your site how important your site is in the eyes of the algorithm. Relevancy, so how much your content is relevant to other content. So let's say you've created a product page and there's people asking questions about that product. You wanna create content that answers those questions and then provides direction to that product page. Uh, popularity is, can be fostered through social media. It can be just Google search results as well. Uh, and technical is all the, the bits and pieces of a website. It can be page speed. It can be whether or not you have schema on your site, which is a way of marking up data so that it can be found for Google and all the other search engines can index that information easily and, and present it. And that usually end up being like feature snippets, those top of Google search results that sometimes don't lead to traffic. There's ways to get around that. We can talk about that later. But that's, those are the four main elements I like to think about from SEO. And the first thing I like to do, uh, besides making sure your website's technically sound, um, usually with technically sound sites, I would get a developer involved. There are some elements you can do, um, things you can look at, but you're going to really need somebody with a bit of expertise to go through there. But beyond that, keyword research is really where I like to start with SEO. And I find it's, it's a little bit more tangible for people. And one free tool, and I highly recommend this guy, if, if you're using Chrome, you can get this as an extension. It's called Keywords Everywhere, and I'm, gonna, I'm using your computer mic, so I'm going to click through and do, do a little sample here. Um, let me just do a search. Do, all right. Oh, sorry, I was base. Oh, yeah, I don't have the plugin installed on here. Do you mind if I put the plugin no, on? No, yeah, go ahead. All right. Absolutely. Or extension, excuse me. I haven't used it in a while. Um, yeah, third from the right icon there. Yeah. Square box. Third from the right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just the standard. Let's back it up. So, Keywords Everywhere is this great tool uh, that you can basically, when you, you, it's a Chrome extension, it's free. 
When you do a search, it'll populate on the right-hand sidebar in the desktop, that big white empty space usually on most computers, a list of related keywords. So it'll take that main keyword you're using and give you other variants, not, not variants of it specifically, but um, ideas of other longer tail keywords, give you an idea of what uh, keywords you can go after. But it also does a great thing where it, it presents you the search volume. So that's the amount of times something is searched in a month. So it's great to rank for a term if, like, say we have a client that comes to us and they go, oh, I want to rank for t-shirts in Annapolis Valley. But if nobody searches that term and you rank for it, that's great bragging rights, but it's not going to translate into any sort of traffic. So using a tool like this, you can input your words. Say you wanted to rank for, I don't know, Annapolis Farms. Um, it would allow you, know, allow you to know how many people are searching for it on a monthly basis, just on the right-hand sidebar. Then there's another tool I like to use to get kind of the questions that people are asking. It's called Answer the Public. And I think we're actually going to be able to do a live demo because I don't need to log in for this. So um, Answer the Public, this wonderfully angry, grumpy old man. Um, could somebody, somebody have a keyword they're kind of curious about that they'd like us to run through here? Just look for a broad concept, not like really two or three words. Video making. Video making. OK, great. Yeah, he'll get angry with you if you don't do anything for a little while. <laughs> All right, let's, let's just write in videos so we can keep it a little bit more broad. So we'll get a list of questions here. So what this is doing is creating questions, propositions, comparisons, and alphabeticals mm -hmm. of, uh, around that main topic that you're talking about. It gives you this nice visual, which is really pretty and will look good on a slide deck or something like that. I'm a data guy. You can export it as a CSV as well. And with that other tool that I mentioned, Keywords Everywhere, and I'll, I'll leave Mike with a link that has a list of all the resources I talk about here, so you guys can go and visit it afterwards and play around with these tools. Using Keywords Everywhere, you can take that CSV and basically dump that information in to find out all the search volume around those terms. And then running that through a spreadsheet program, you can sort by the search volume, get rid of anything that doesn't have any search volume, and go after your high-level search volumes. It'll also show you competition. Uh, and they base that on uh, AdWords data. So the amount of competition will determine kind of how easy it is for you to rank for it. So they want, ideally, and it's not always going to be the case, something that has low competition but high volume and is still relevant to what, you're, what uh, you're, you're selling or what your product or your business is about. And you're trying to find longer tail phrases to write content to support those pages. <laughs> So the good thing about these question, uh, this question content is it can populate this top position uh, called the Featured Snippet. And I picked this one um, just because it, it's a search for how to SEO. And I found the phrase so awkward, but it had some search volume behind it. And it was interesting to see what comes up. Um, so these question type uh, answers can get populated up here. And, and if you guys use uh, Google Home uh, or any like voice assistant, this populated information up here would come back on a Google Home device if you were to search it. Now, if it's Alexa, I think Alexa uses Bing. I don't know if anybody's up on that. Uh, I know Apple uses, they used to use Bing. They use somebody, Siri uses something else now. They might have switched to Google. They were with Bing for a long time. But uh, Google still seems to be a bit of a gold standard for that. So by creating, answering the questions that have high search volume for your competition, you have an opportunity to be listed in voice search, which is slowly becoming one of, one of the bigger, uh, one of the new emerging markets, kind of the harder thing to measure at this point um, in an analytics standpoint. Any questions about that? Um, yes. Just, can you backtrack just now, the video making, and then those questions that are oh, generated? Yeah. Can you just read out a few of those a questions? Few? Yeah, sure. Let's we'll see what we got here. Hard to read. This video is pretty. There's some comedy gold in there too. What's that? There's some comedy gold in there. Is there? Because you have Scooby Doo. Oh yeah. <laughs> you can probably nail that one down. Yeah. Videos when calls the heart. Uh, there's some awkward language in here as well. Uh, it's, it's, why videos are playing slow. So I guess videos was a little bit too of a broad uh, search. But the um, <coughs> but was really interesting the um, the the 
uh, the first circle of words, like that's basic journalism, like who, what, where, when, why, all of that kind of stuff. It and that makes that's sense. What, that's what you're trying to answer, right? Yeah, exactly. The who, what, where, and why of your product. Yeah. So if you have a product you're trying to sell or you have a business you're trying to promote and you're looking for content ideas, this is a great way to get an idea for content. Yeah. And uh, what I recommend for companies, if, what I would suggest you do is run this, just take the whole dump of all the questions, put them through this program, expert yourself at CSV, figure out your search volume, sort it by that, take a look at competition, use that as a deciding factor as well. And then take, uh, and when you're ready to, uh, when you've got your high level topics that you want to talk about, run them through Google Trends and go back a few years to see when the spikes are. And that'll give you an idea of when you can release it. And what I like to do is release content on social media a few weeks before a spike, or depends on how frequently it's searched. If it's really high volume, it can be a few days, just to kind of get the buzz out there. Because what social media tends to do is create searches. If people find things on social media, it's more likely to get searched shortly afterwards. So you want to be slightly behind that wave, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Oh, well, you want some more of those uh, terms? or? Where videos store Android, where videos on iPhone. There's a bunch in here. I highly recommend just run that product run, and you'll get all the questions yourself. Yeah. Any other questions about? Can you go back over that finding the trends thing again? Google Trends. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's. Do you have a, a sample phrase we could run through? Soap making. Soap making, okay. Let's see. Okay. Google themselves publishes this data, right? Like the frequency of keyword searches? Yes. Okay. And you can drill down. I found when you get down sometimes Nova Scotia can give you some real <coughs> decent data. But when you get down to individual areas in Nova Scotia, sometimes they just have no data. But uh, soap making. <laughs> Michael, did you say to release before the forecast is spent? Or after? Just before. Yeah, you want to influence more searches. You want to be kind of, and that's on social media. Uh, you even, yeah, if you have your content, what I suggest doing is find your biggest spike and use that to kind of structure your content calendar. So you've got, let's say you've come up with 24 ideas, you're going to release two a month. Uh, you take those 24 ideas, run them all individually through Google Trends, and you can export this data as well and, and compile it all together, and then you'll have an idea of when things are going to spike and you kind of position your content in a logical way. And then when you're looking, when you see secondary spikes, uh, I would suggest automating releases on your social media platforms, be it Facebook or if you're more B2B with LinkedIn, and that gives you an opportunity to set that up automatically and you'll get these little boosts, this like secondary waves of information as you're going through. Does that make sense? So this is Google Trends, this is soap making. This is for the US. Uh, would you like to drill down to Canada? The US is pretty useful. Yeah, that's fair. U.S. tends to be a really good microcosm as well. If you want to look at the world, but the data is kind of too much, I've always found that the U.S. is kind of pretty decent unless you're working with a specific niche. So then the spikes are just before Christmas. Looks like it. I'd say. And just before the end of the school year. You got April. Not quite the end of the school year. That's weird, eh? December 30th to January 5th. A lot of people searching. Uh, that last week, I would take it with a grain of salt because sometimes the data is not complete. But then, yeah, November. Just before Christmas. Yeah. People are mixing. Interesting. A big spike just before spring fever. <laughs> and this is. This is from 2004 yeah. onwards. So, if you wanted to get a couple different uh, years in there, because you yeah. don't, there'll be things that'll influence this as well. So it's, it's yeah. just to kind of give you an idea, broad idea. So you say to publish yourself yeah, slightly bad. before the spike, why the slightly before? Is there like a reputation kind of lag or, or percolated or? So you can get it on social media because social media will influence those searches. Right, but you're, you're assuming some kind of slight delay before like you can't get those or... Yeah, well you don't want to be after the wave. Right. It's the opposite of surfing. You don't want to be riding the wave, you want to be climbing up and fighting it the whole way I guess. But in this analogy, it's like the waves reversed. I'm getting, making this way too couple. Yeah, that so, uh, you lost me. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, you want to get, if 
content's going down the hill, you want to be like up a little bit higher up on the hill, so you're going to roll faster past everyone else. You don't want to be following people after they've kind of published the content. Okay. Any other questions about that? Optimizing your content. This is pretty straightforward. Um, basically, you want to put your main keyword as close to the front of the title as possible. There's been a lot of studies done that says the closer to the front, the better. Um, your URL, um, I, I use tools like this just to kind of get a sample of what it will potentially look like. Um, you can also do a site colon search. If you're familiar with Google operators, you just type in site colon and then your URL. And it'll, it'll output what Google is indexing right now. Now, it's not a pure representation because they will change titles and descriptions based on the intent of the searcher. Uh, but it, it's an, it gives you an idea where things are at. Um, with uh, meta descriptions, it's interesting because the algorithm does not actually look for keywords in the meta description. But what it will do, Google, and I'm using Google broadly. Search, there are other search engines, but they really have such a blind share of the market that if you Fall, if you're pretty much aiming towards Google, uh, most of them are going to follow suit to that. And if you're getting into really focusing on other search engines like Bing, or if you're operating in Russia or China, then you're probably going to want somebody professional in there to, to work on this. It's not going to be like a hobby type of thing. But uh, with meta descriptions, what happens is if you have the keyword in there, it will bold it. So for example, I use SEO, Annapolis, and Valley as, um, as uh, keywords in this sample. And SEO is bolded. So what that does is it draws the eyes and leads to a higher click-through rate, and that higher click-through rate is actually a ranking factor in Google's algorithm. So title is a direct influencer. We're having the keyword in there. Meta description is an indirect influencer where it will manipulate the search results and draw more click-throughs. And title and meta description, and I should have probably cleared that up at the beginning, there, it's hidden information on your website in the background that's allowing uh, search engines, tabs, to know what your content's about. So would a website builder provide you access to that, or do you need somebody to help you? Uh, depends. If you have a CMS, usually you'll have control over that. If you're using WordPress, I would recommend Yoast. is probably the most user-friendly. All-in-one SEO is a good one as well. Um, mm -hmm. If you're using something else, like Wix, I think, has something built in as well. Uh, Squarespace does. Most of them will, if you have a CMS, it should offer it, uh, the ability to manipulate that title and description, or the ability to add a plugin that would allow you to manipulate that. <clears throat> if it's a custom-built CMS, or it's a custom-built or a hand-built site, you may need to get a developer involved. But then you might want to also explore something like Wix, or well, stay away from Wix. Uh, but uh, maybe WordPress, or sorry if anybody uses Wix. I can explain to you why I stay away from Wix. <laughs> yeah, this why? Meeting. Lots of people love that. Um, it's really easy. It's really easy to use. Uh, the URL structure for blog content is really long and convoluted. They still use a lot of numbers in the URL structure, which uh, tends to not provide a lot of trust. If you were to get on the first page with that type of a URL, you're not going to get as much click-through rate because people will see URLs like a WordPress URL that might have just slash blog and then the slug, the the title of it. Uh, so. It's not such a big concern if you're Wix and you're a big company and you've already got a strong content process, um, presence, but if you're trying to build up that content presence and you're competing against bigger people, then it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. Other than that, I think Wix is fine. They've done some really great things in the last little bit. I know uh, Rand Fishkin from uh, Moz, and in the SEO world, he's kind of like one of our celebrities, um, is, it did a big a piece on Wix saying that it's really great, but I, I think he he ignored that small business concept. I think a tool like WordPress is a lot better, or Squarespace, for uh, getting um, for small businesses to get a better presence. And Squarespace is, is comparable to Wix, I think, from price standpoint, usability as well. And anybody has an argument against that? I would love to hear it. No, not right now. I mean, we can talk <laughs> afterwards. I'm not, and I know I'm a one star fight. I just I like to finish the conversation. Uh, content and backlinks. So, content, um, one of the main reasons to drive content is to rank it. One of the main factors 
for ranking is the authority. And authority is influenced from backlinks. So backlinks are basically other sites outside of your site that are referencing your information and uh, transferring a bit of their authority to your page. And a technique I like to use, I call baiting for backlinks, is um, when I'm preparing content, and this works really well, I was in hospitality and tourism for quite a long time, uh, with hotels, when we had a new hotel opening, we would get them to write about things in their neighborhood because people are staying at a hotel, let's say you're in Manhattan, you're, you're sleeping in the hotel, you wanna know what's around, you wanna know where's the hot dog stand, like where, where can I go get tickets for a Broadway show, you wanna know all, that, all those small businesses around you that's gonna make your life easier and your trip amazing. So what we would get them to do is reference two or three uh, pieces, uh, local businesses in their, uh, in their blog content. Sometimes just one, depending on the content. Um, and when they would reference this, before they would release it, they would make contact with somebody, one of these smaller local businesses, present them a content saying, we're going to write about this, we've mentioned you guys, this is what we're saying about you, we just want to make sure it's on point. So at this point, you've invested somebody outside of your organization that, uh, and it made them own a piece of your content. And so with a little bit of back and forth, you'll get this hammered out, they'll be happy with what you're gonna do. And when you push this live, you send them another email and you say, hey, just want to let you know this live. If, you're, if you wanna share it on social media, this is where it's at. Pretty soft, nine times out of 10, they're gonna share this. Now, they might even share it from their website. If they share it from their website, it's a direct backlink. If they share it on their social media, they've just increased your reach. And by increasing your reach on social media, you increase the opportunity to be, because uh, social media, I used to think, I've read conflicting studies, Initially, I thought social media was kind of separate, uh, and what I've been seeing lately is there actually has, uh, Google has direct relationships with Twitter, Facebook, and is using this information. I know it's getting kind of creepy with all this information <laughs> stuff sharing, and it's free, we gotta kind of expect it. We're giving away a lot of our privacy, it kind of sucks, but. Um, so, by increasing this um, social media awareness and this reach, you have an opportunity to get um, backlinks from outside of social media. More people are seeing it. So that's a really nice way of doing backlinks. I found like the big tactical backlink approaches where you just do these massive uh, outputs, just low return. You're looking at like 1% return if all you're just doing a big batch uh, outreach. And the ones you do get returned from are kind of looking for something else in return. And we, and, and or them trying to get you to buy mad. And it, it's questionable at best. I found this technique is really a lot more natural. And even if uh, Google was to penalize your site for doing something weird or release an algorithm update, this kind of content from local businesses in your area is a strong, it's, it's not gonna get penalized. If it gets penalized, it's a mistake on their part and they'll correct it eventually. Google my business. So how many people here are brick and mortar businesses? Cool. You guys ever Google my business claim? Yeah. Awesome. All right. We won't go too in depth on this. Uh, you'll be happy to know that you can tell Caitlin I took out the digital Nova Scotia example. Oh, nice. So, but St. Effects has not claimed to Google my business. Uh, Acadia did at St. Mary's in Dallas. Uh, so, basically, if you have a brick and mortar business and it says own this business down here, excuse me, claim it. And the reason why I say that, especially when I was working on hospitality and, ter and tourism there, I was going to say terrorism. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, we had to compete with trip advisors and those big aggregators. And they're, they're just massive powerhouses with a lot of authority to pass around. And the, the three pack, uh, basically when you get those map results, was leveled the playing field. Because you can't get a trip advisor in for, if you were to search Hotels New York, Below that map pack is TripAdvisors, Expedia, Hotels.com, et cetera, Booking.com, and all those other ones. But that three pack had legitimate hotels. And you could drill it down to different boroughs and whatnot, and you're going to get those actual uh, properties. With Google My Business as well, it's ideal to maintain it. Because if you've claimed it, you've verified it, doesn't uh, Google and other people in your business are doing it, Google will start to favor ones that are active. And by active, I mean 
you're adding Google Posts. Whenever you have a special, and I know they've moved Google Posts down a little bit lower, and if you're not familiar with Google Posts, it's basically a way of putting a little bit of social media, and it, it'd be right below this part right here, and it'll show up in map results as well. You can have about two and a half posts. You can have as many as you want, but two and a half will directly show up. Uh, and you can link to specific, uh, special offers, any events that are coming up, specific products. You can uh, set timelines so you can have it disappear at a certain point. Um, if it's only an offer that's going for a week, uh, you can basically highlight key information in secondary pages on your site right in those results, which is really powerful. And that uh, it allows you to highlight that information, but it also lets Google know that you're active and you're maintaining this. And that is a strong signal to them. Reviews is also another strong signal. Uh, that's don't uh, don't solicit directly for reviews, but you can politely ask people like, if you liked my your experience with me, please like. Review me on Google, uh, and it doesn't. Have, and if it's a negative review, that's not the end of the world. Just respond to it. Try to take it offline as quickly as possible, but show publicly that you're responding to it. That's a great signal, just from you, from a user standpoint. If they see a one-star review, but then they see somebody from the business communicating with them in a polite, proper way, that it's going to lead to more. And eventually, that one-star review will get buried. If you're doing a good job, you'll have four or fives, and then it'll it'll, it'll uh, average out. Another technique we used to do with hotels, and I think it works very well with a lot of other brick and mortar businesses, is update your images specifically, I would say once a quarter if you've got the ability, especially if you have any sort of outside, uh, you can show different seasons, which will show that it's active. It's weird to look up a, I don't know, a, I was gonna say a golf course in the winter, but no one's gonna go golf in the winter. But if you're looking for, I know it's, uh, I always find it weird when I get directions to a place, but the, the Google map image is, like a green, and it's February, because it's just not green. But um, yeah, if you can update your images on a regular basis, update new products, add new products, that's a great opportunity there. There's all kinds of little parts in there that you can label differently, and those are also signals as well to Google. Search engines, I'll stop saying Google, because search engines. <laughs> uh, so yeah, th this is an example of a Google post. I think this one's gone now. I used to uh, talk to anybody if they buy me eggs and bacon for SEO, <laughs> and I called it SEO brunch. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an example of the, of the post. This is uh, the knowledge graph result, and this is a map result. So I'll get away from that so you guys can kind of see it. So very similar results. You have to click through to see this. So if you had that list would be like a bunch of different businesses. Once you click that, you would see that at the bottom. Or this would be on the right-hand side for branded search. So if you were to search SEO brunch or uh, St. FX, it would have that post at the bottom. It used to be in a more prominent position, and actually Google's moved it down a little bit, which has killed a little bit of the click-through rate, but they're still using it as a signal that, that the, uh, the listing's active. Any questions about that part? Can I make a comment? One thing that I did for me that, that made a big difference is I added service areas. Yeah. Because Naples Valley is so small, uh, and a lot of my clients are actually coming from Halifax now, mm -hmm. I added all those different areas where you can do that. So yeah. you're not limited to just where you are. I people would manually edit. That's really powerful, especially if you're not if you're not having people come to your business like right into your business. Or do you have I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you added it as a service area business. Can because you still I'm, get the address? I'm one of a little in the province that does what I do, so okay. I get everybody from from everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was amazing how much more business I got when I added those search areas, those service areas. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, cool. Any other questions or comments? Yes. I noticed that you asked in specific to brick and mortar locations. So yeah. I I have a service based business, and I put up my listing and just specify the service areas. Yeah. I don't have to provide an address, and and that made a huge difference. I think a lot of service-based businesses don't know that they can do that, but they don't know that they don't have to put in a specific address if you're based where you're at home. Yeah. Because um, right. I don't want anyone knocking on my door. No, and that, that is, like, my listing up there is my home address. I work at my house. And, no, yeah, you can do it as a service area, area or, yeah, service area business. So, yeah, sorry, I, I glossed over that. I didn't even talk about that. But that's a great point, yeah. Well, and especially if you're new and you're not ranking on anything. Yeah. And like my um, my area of, of business, there's a lot of older people who do what I do, so okay. not as tech savvy. Tech savvy. So you, you got then all of a sudden I was like in that top three when I wasn't ranking anywhere in any of the other search terms. So yeah, I, yeah. smart. A little bit of that. 
One thing I, I do with my Google My Business listings, my clients' Google My Business listings, is use UTM parameters at the end. Um, they do, and what that does is in your analytics account, you can segment that traffic. So you know specifically what's coming from, especially in Search Console. And if anybody's played with Search Console, that's like analytics but for actual keywords. You can see what pages rank for what, what their average position is, what that click through rate is. So, uh, and then if by adding that tracking parameter, and just search UTM parameters, you, and Google's tool will allow you to populate one, um, you can find out exactly what traffic's coming from Google My Business versus your home page. It's kind of interesting. Especially with branded search results, because you're gonna have that top position, especially with a very unique work and name. And then you're gonna have the knowledge graph on the side. And if the knowledge graph has got the UTM parameter on the side, I'll switch that around, I'm doing it as if, reverse it in, in your head if you can, uh, then you'll know who, who's clicking on this part or this part, which can be really powerful information if you want to really dig into it. Yes? I'm not sure of the question I'm even asking here, but I, I find like lots of times I'm searching for something new and I can't find, figure out where the people are from. Like, it's not the FF their address, but it's not, it's like even the area. Like you're not even sure what part of the world they're coming from. Like is, is there a benefit of putting like your area into this or? You'd have to put your area into the Google My Business. Oh, okay. So you'd have, so there'd have to be, to get that listing, right. you have to have a physical address. Even if you don't list your address, you have to have one for them to deliver the postcard. Yeah. If the location is unimportant, if you're selling all over the world, yeah. don't want Google to put in way the location for you. Avoid that? You can. Um, most of my clientele is from all over the world. I have very few in Nova Scotia. No, what I mean is I'm selling. I'm not selling in Nova Scotia. Okay. I'm selling in Europe and Australia and the US. Right. So I don't want the fact that I'm in Nova Scotia to be of any relevance to my customers. Well, then that doesn't matter. So that this would be relevant if you want to rank for, let's, what's your business if you don't mind me asking? I software. I sell software. So if you want to rank for software in Annapolis, then this is important. If you're, you're not going to, you don't want, like, Australian software, it's too broad of a term. So you probably, you're looking at something completely different. Um, I have one, I have a client that's uh, software based and what you can claim is the brand page. When you get to a certain level, Google will start populating the knowledge graph with just brand information. It looks similar to that Google My Business, but it doesn't include uh, uh, address information. Uh, and there is a way to get a branded page without it being popular enough that they already create one. But it, it's also good practice to look to see if some if Google has created a listing for you, because they will do that. So I, if anybody's unsure if they have a listing yet, do a search, because Google will create one, and then I would claim that, because other people will claim it. If not, I've seen this, and there's a company in Montreal that claims restaurant pages for restaurants that aren't claiming them, and then drives them all to this page. It's basically a, a scrape of the, uh, of the restaurant page, and they're just taking that traffic and using it to uh, for, for other things, so. Name scoring, but with yeah. Google businesses. Pretty yeah. much, yeah. Good, good. yeah. Classic uh, oh, well, techniques, uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, concerns, hopes, dreams? I wasn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> no dreams left? So measuring success, uh, expectations. That's uh, probably the toughest thing of being an SEO consultant is kind of explaining to people Years, there's no number one in Google anymore. Um, and your, my searches in, in this area versus home are going to be completely different. Um, they're going to be different from my phone to my desktop. Uh, somebody else's uh, search in the same area will be different because it's going to be based on, if you're logging in with a, a Gmail account to your uh, Chrome account and you're doing searches, it's influenced on your past and what, what you're doing. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, it's also... When it comes to explaining this to clients or just to have realistic expectations, I never say let's, let's, not, let's stop focusing on trying to get the first position for a specific keyword. Let's focus on getting more organic traffic. And you can see that very clearly in analytics. And then it's also not about just getting more traffic. Initially, yes, you do want to get more traffic. After a while, it becomes getting more traffic that converts. So people that are actually calling you or sending you an email, filling out a contact form or signing up for an email newsletter or you're actually selling the product online, sell, buying the product. Um, that's what you really want. So it's not about ranking first, 
It's about driving more traffic and more and that traffic being more qualified and that converting into money. Sorry, Mike. Do you have any of your clients um, reorganize some of their branding in general to boost their reputation and their and their visibility? Like 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 this gentleman that's doing the software. Because he's he doesn't really have a he's not tied to a location, mm -hmm. so he doesn't rank high for, for a specific place. Mm -hmm. But if he had a specialty or something along those lines that made that would differentiate his brand more, that would boost his his visibility, I suppose. Do you have anybody that actually looked at looked at the results and then changed or at least pivoted, not pivoted what they were doing, but pivoted how they presented it to boost their reputation. Yeah, actually, I have it kind of at the opposite spectrum. So I have a client um, that is uh, industry leader for cross-browser testing, um, and a, uh, a secondary company called that's coming up called SmartBear released a product called Software Cross uh, yeah. Cross Browser Testing, yeah, yeah. and literally they bought CrossBrowserTesting.com, and so that day they went to app. second position. Yeah. And as time goes on, they're they're losing ground to that. And to top that off, these guys are doing a very strong content play. So they're answering those questions about this specific product, and they're driving almost 50% of their organic traffic purely from blog content. And that's also driving about 25% of their backlinks, which is their authority. Yeah. So they're they're getting they're they're still these guys have been around longer, and they are the industry leader. So they still have. Uh, they're still a bigger, stronger company, but they're slowly losing ground, and they're recognizing that so we're working to, to correct that. So the, it does happen. Um, I wouldn't suggest with Google My Business, don't put in like your regional name. Put in your actual legal name. Um, it's okay to talk about your region in the title, or if, if that's what you're going for, or if it's a specific niche, mention it. I highly recommend that. Find out what keywords people are searching for that or what variants the strongest one and make that your strongest focus on your home page or the individual product page or key performing pages. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Yeah? You run into cases where people don't just want volume of phone calls because they're not qualified. Like yeah. You don't want your phone to ring off, ring off the hook none of them are if they're not converting into actual sales right. yeah, that happens and that comes back to the quantity over uh, quality over quantity uh, argument. so if you, if you sort of win this case it could be too much of a bad thing if you're if you're getting tons of volume and the time it takes to answer those calls and none of them are the people you want that sounds like a good problem to have unless if you're getting tons of calls and you can convert those i would start looking at some convert, automation right. processes if you don't have the manpower to, to back that up but that's more of a business concern um like a broader business concern not this kind of specific niche so yeah that could potentially be an issue but if you're getting a lot of calls for a phrase that is very relevant to what you're doing then that's a good problem to have in my opinion. If they're not converting, then it might be a, a deeper issue from more of a, a business standpoint that needs to be explored. I like my, I'm a bookkeeper. And <laughs> okay. I, I think bookkeepers are a dime a dozen. Yeah. You can yeah. find them, you can throw a stick and hit a bookkeeper, yeah. and I bet you they're, they're less expensive than I am. And I don't think that the average person who's Googling bookkeeper Halifax wants to pay what I'm worth. Right. And I think that the volume, I'm not looking for that volume, yeah. I, I don't want to win that race. Right. It's a race to the bottom of what's your lowest hourly right. rate you're willing to do. I'd much rather have one call a week of someone who sees the value than 10 calls a week of people who say, you charge what? And right. then hang up on me. That, I completely understand. Not that I really have had either happen. But no. You know. But um, then I would try to discover your niche and try to rank for that. <coughs> uh, or find a different region. Like if you're getting most of your uh, business out of, say, San Francisco, where you're probably, you could charge a higher rate, you're still cheaper than somebody that, like, like what's, uh, poverty level's 100K in San Francisco, I think, yeah. something ridiculous. Like, so if you can, yeah, I would try to find a niche and try to rank for that. So then you get more qualified calls. You might not have the, the amount of volume, but that volume's gonna convert to more qualified leads. So, should you go in-house or hire a professional? Uh, I, broadly speaking, I think it comes down to time or money. If you've got time right now, 
and you want to take advantage of this, there's lots of resources online. Uh, the, the URL I'll pass over to you has got a list of resources I like. Uh, Moz is one, the, the, the user groups are pretty good. There's a couple on Facebook. Uh, there's a few uh, subreddits that are really good. Um, and it's, it's an interesting, there's a lot of garbage on these as well. But uh, Moz is a really strong resource if you want to get a good idea. And then I find digging into those subreddits gives you kind of an idea on the dark side of things. But uh, if you've got time, this is a great way to generate, I'd say, like passive information. So if you're already creating information for social media and you're able to optimize that content you're putting out for keywords that are being searched, after your social media push, this is going to keep driving in traffic from an organic source. So that's, that's, a, that's a strong signal. Like if you're already putting that effort into social, there's no reason why you can't add an element of, of SEO to that, uh, that approach. If you don't have time, I would highly recommend paying somebody to do that. Part of my whole, uh, I guess, mission ask of trying to do these talks is to give you guys kind of the information so you can ask the right questions because there are some kind of questionable people out there that are offering these types of services that will give you a pretty report and it doesn't really translate into traffic. So it's good to, when you're hiring somebody, ask them what they consider a success metric. And, or come in with what you already want to be a success metric and explain that to them, but be open to what they're going to come back with. And if they don't have a real clear idea of that, <clears throat> I mean, give them access to your analytics account so they can see kind of what you're doing. And if you don't have analytics set up on your site, I highly recommend it. It's free. It's not that hard to do. Um, if you're running a WordPress site, there's lots of plugins. You can just plug it in and get into Tag Manager and all that other stuff. It's really fun as well. But out of the box, it does a lot of really good tracking and you can do some goal work as well. Most SEO people should have at least a broad concept of analytics and how to kind of optimize that to set up proper goals. If not, they have a resource that they can access to do that. Uh, so if you do have money, I highly recommend uh, investing in this. It's a bit of a longer play than say social or like paid campaigns because sometimes you won't see traction for a quarter to a year almost. Um, but in the long term, it, it is a good approach. I would say to you probably don't, if you're a small business, don't need to go into a, a monthly retainer. You more or less, what you should be looking for is somebody who can audit your site, so just give you a technical idea of what's wrong with your site and how to fix it. Generally, they won't fix it. What they'll do is give you an itemized list of what needs to be fixed, and you can give that to your developer. You can usually get that. You can either prioritize it yourself or get the developer to go through and tell them, tell you what kind of effort versus return, and that the, the SEO professional should be able to give you a list of kind of where they see the, the, the strongest possibilities, and then you can compare that and create a list for your developer. Um, yeah, that's uh, kind of the basis of it. Any questions about that? Is anybody considering hiring somebody outside for doing their SEO work? Are they thinking about playing with it themselves? Yes? Well, that never been able to find out. Someone has shown me how to turn data analytics and Google analytics into money. Say, how to turn Google analytics into money? Google analytics data information. So you want like an e-commerce e setup? No, I've got an e-commerce setup. Yeah. And also got Google analytics. What do I? Uh, what is? What? What information? What is there in Google analytics that can help me guide me increase my sales? Edit the book. Edit. It's dead. It's not going to increase your sales. All you're going to need somebody to either analyze it. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, I, there's uh, a few good. Um, I, I can put you in contact with a couple good analytics guys if you're interested. Um, I know a guy actually. If you want to talk afterwards, I'll I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. get your email and I'll just send you a, an introduction email if you'd like. Okay. What you'd want is enhanced e-commerce setup, and then uh, from that, you want to start digging into it. So like analytics is kind of it's really broad. So like from my standpoint, I look at organic traffic, and what I'll do is I'll look for um, top sites, and I'll compare that. Usually when I do a site audit, I'll go through, I'm not, I'll get sites that are like 10,000 pages. I'll go through and find the top 25 pages uh, in, um, that are from, uh, from a traffic standpoint for like, let's say a year, and then I'll look at like the top 10 blog posts. And then I'll look at the top 25 pages that are converting. So if you had your enhanced e-commerce set on that, it'll be a different list and uh, look at why those pages aren't converting. The ones, like if there's pages that are ranking but not converting, then it starts becoming that kind of pinpoint and digging down. That makes sense. Uh, same with blog content. 
you're probably not going to sell with blog content. You're just going to try to push people to the product page. So if that secondary page is product page and then they convert from there, then it becomes uh, useful. So yeah, it's a it's a slew of information, and digging through it can be unless you know specifically what you're doing or like say. You're coming at it from a specific angle. I'm going to go in and look for organic traffic and how that's performing. Uh, somebody who specializes in SEM is going to go in and look at paid traffic and see how that's converting and relay that app off of their other tools as well. Uh, same with social media. The social people are going to go through and dig that and then also go back to their social media tools to see where, the, where it lines up. Does that make sense? Yeah. What Pierre says is, is pretty true because the hardest part is, is trusting, finding somebody you trust to do some of the things or, or that you're sure can help you. I kind of uh, relate it to advertising. Like, you, know, you, you go talk to five or six different advertisers, you go, oh, we can all do this for you. Yeah, blah, 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 give me a bunch of money, and then it doesn't work out well, you did something wrong. It's the mm -hmm. same with social media. Everybody will say, oh, well, do this, do this, do this, and you don't get traffic, you don't get sales, like, well, you did something wrong. So it's not the one you get tired of kind of, you can't, you don't know who to trust. So maybe it's you don't know the questions to ask, maybe it's you don't know how to qualify those people or whatever, so I don't know, it's just a comment. If you go in with a clear like uh, key performance indicator, like a KPI, um, or like a success metric, go in with like a, go in with your expectation, but go in with like an open mind to the conversation, because I think a lot of people will, uh, not myself, I'd like to go in with like, a, like you want this, well, let's, that's possible, but I think we should look at it maybe a little bit broader and look at this and that. But we try to define that at the beginning of the relationship. So you'll know if it's working or not. Um, so these people get paid by results, though? No, God forbid. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I mean, fight your turn. <laughs> it's just hard. It's just hard. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's also hard from the other side, right? Oh, I'm sure it is. It's uh, a lot of it's gambles, and a lot from a consulting standpoint, we're providing direction. It's up to the person to actually uh, implement and to implement the way you suggested. Right. Uh, at that point, you've passed the ball. It's up to them to take it to the the end zone. I'm using that football analogy. I never played a game of football <laughs> in my life, so if I use the wrong terminology, I'm, I apologize. Well, I, think, I think sometimes it's just people don't know what they really want. It's like they think they know what they want, but they don't really know what they want. And, That's, and then you're not really talking on the same page. Yeah. Like and I, I think it, go in with questions and define what you think is success and ask them what they think is success. And find something in the middle that works for both of you before you start an engagement. That's success right. is the sales exceed the cost of the SEO. But should exceed about 10 times. Ideally. I mean, but that's lifetime as well. So, or maybe, yeah. I'd say like a year-ish. 